Meet Jan Reynolds, world-class skier and mountain climber, photographer and writer of children's books on lost cultures. She holds the women's record for high altitude skiing and was one of the first to climb and ski around Mount Everest. Reynolds has been a photographer and writer for National Geographic and other major publications and has written 14 books about vanishing cultures she has immersed herself in over the when years. When a balloonist wanted her to join an expedition to Balloon 2 and then ski down Mount Everest, she said yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Jan Reynolds. Jan Reynolds, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of camaraderie because I've always traveled in small groups. It's either been three or four of us and just by chance, I've always been the only female in the group, and that's, it's really fun. Back when I was high altitude climbing and setting records, I was the only woman on the expedition. There weren't many mm. women, um, not that they couldn't, mm -hmm. I don't think, but there just weren't that many women that were actually doing what I was doing. And now, the younger crop, it's actually another generation All that right. has grown up with the idea that this is what women do. I was just one of the first women that ever did something like that. There weren't that many men doing what I was doing at that time. Definitely in my 20s, I was like a little boy, too. I was as much... Um, go get them as the guys. So he said, here's where we'll be. And I had to stop him for a minute. I said, Craig, do you know what time we left today? No. Do you know um, what time it is now? No. You know, here's how much ground we've covered in this amount of time. And if we try to make there, we're only going to make it to here. And they see their mistake, but they can't quite say, oh, OK, you got it right. They'll go like, Jan doesn't want to go to here. She only <laughs> wants to go this far. And he'd say it to the other guys. But they could right. never quite say, She's right. She's right. Let's <laughs> Is that funny? I did a lot of research for a new book that I'm working mm -hmm. on uh, about gender differences. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is when men communicate, it's often about who's top dog, who's got it right. And mm -hmm. I watched that among the men. If, when we were climbing, women, through conversation, like to bond. Men uh, actually compete. We make great co-leaders because Ned has 10 times the testosterone I do. I do. And testosterone keeps him focused on winning and power, and he has more of an appetite for risk-taking. He's more aggressive and assertive, and his, his way of working is autocratic. Now, me, being on estrogen, it has me more focused on bonding and connection. It discourages conflict and risk-taking, and I tend to be more democratic and empathic in the way I work. And, and that's when I learned women have more endurance than men, but a mm. marathon isn't quite long enough to show that, a running marathon or a ski mm. marathon. But when you get into something like an expedition, as the days wear on, uh, women have an extra fat layer that men don't have. And a lot of that's about survival and childbirth and sure. being able to support your child and nurse. So that when, when I was on the expedition and we ran out of food after a couple of months and the men were bonking, I was still going. I was the one that we'd go in, we'd build the fire, the, the men would crash and I'd be the one uh, out getting some brush to build the fire, melting snow for water, and I realized I just had a little more gas than they had. I wasn't trying to prove anything because I was female. I only did it because it's what I really love. Do you enjoy beating the boys? Well, I must admit it's fun. <laughs> Oh, Chris's cake. Oh. I like to respect the customs of the people I'm visiting. This shows them that I want to learn about their way of life. So even though it was different continents, it really allowed me to see how similar all human beings are. I realized that what really captivated me was the open hearts of all the Native people I met. He wanted to know how I managed my trip as a single female with no horse or no weapon. I told him that through Dawa, these people have become my friends and that I never carry a weapon to threaten anyone. And I travel on foot, just like the locals do. This way, I feel many more people will trust and accept me. So the next morning, I dug myself clear. And when I came out, I found I was in the middle of a whiteout. When you're in a whiteout, you can't even see your feet. It's that thick. I had no sense of direction whatsoever. However, Kenilogok's father had shown me 
how to interpret the ridges of snow that the wind creates. So I skied back on what I thought was the same angle. <clears throat> and the same, in that, with that direction, I figured I could find the village. So when I came to the door <clears throat> of Kenalogok's family, her father opened it and he looked in when I came inside and he said, so you survived. And I spent time with the Yanomama Indians in the Amazon rainforest in Venezuela, the Tuareg in Africa, and uh, let's see, the Sami, commonly known as the Laps, from Lapland here above the Arctic Circle. And I spent some time with the Tibetans in Nepal in the Himalaya. You know, it gave me such a good and broad perspective about people around the world. I could climb, I could ski, I could skydive, I could do whatever I needed to to get into those nooks and crannies to find these indigenous people. Each time I was taken in by a family purely by chance. For months at a time, I would live with them, sharing the rhythms of their lives. And what became clear to me is that these unique indigenous cultures are in serious danger of vanishing from our world. And I thought, what a loss it would be if my children, if all children, weren't able to see some of the things that I had seen. And I switched to doing books for children for that reason, because I felt I would be able to do a better job of educating everyone if I made my books for kids. I remember when I was learning to read, we had Dick, Sally, and Jane. and. Uh, that didn't teach me much other than how to read words, and I think it's important for a child to learn more than just the words. The sooner we can capture a young mind and show them the breadth of culture in the world, the more acceptance we'll have. We're doing the kids a favor first, letting them see the beautiful cultures in the world, in these books when they're a child, but preparing them for a world that is so small that they will be dealing with different cultures, uh, not every month, but every day, every hour. And um, that's what makes life colorful. Where did all this come from? Where were you raised? What kind of family? Oh, I was born in Vermont on a dairy farm, one of seven children. And it was a pretty wonderful, normal um, childhood. I just think I was rambunctious, maybe. I was the farm kid with sweatpants falling off. Sometimes you don't even know what your abilities are until you're pushed into a situation. And when I finally was able to race some Eastern races and figured out what was going on and then made the national team, then it all plugged in for me. When you do one thing and it works out okay and you learn something, you want to take the next step. I don't just pick something for the sake of doing it and proving it can be done. It's a learning process for me, and I'm just following the thread. I just tend to follow it perhaps a little farther than maybe others would. I crossed the Himalaya um, with National Geographic working for them last spring. I took a 19,000-foot pass from Nepal into Tibet, which is absolutely fascinating, and it's probably the, the oldest trade route in history still in use today. I'm settled in my camp at the base of the glacier of the Nongpala. I miss the sound of the yak bells outside my tent comfort of knowing company and transportation is available. I'm alone, feeling very small compared to the big cliffs and glaciers surrounding me in my fragile tent. On the North American continent, I lived with the Inuit in an area called the Barren Lands, which is known for being consistently the coldest spot on Earth. It was colder than the winter in the Himalaya, believe me. It still eludes me how to describe the feeling when you're in the mountains and you are climbing and you're with a couple of buddies that you trust your life with and they trust their life with you. To have that rapport with people and to have your life boiled down to those simple basics, what you're gonna eat and what you're gonna do <laughs> and how you're gonna do it. I haven't found anything in this world that compares. While she rarely thinks much about the dangers she places herself in time and time again, Jan knew this trip had risks. That was probably the riskiest thing that I ever did because if anything went wrong, you're falling out of the sky and you probably wouldn't survive. But above the Himalayas, something did go wrong. There was no way to stop it from crashing. What was I thinking about? Shutting off the gas tank behind me. And obviously, somebody didn't think to shut off the other ones. That's why we caught on fire, because when we rolled, it, it nicked the switch, which caused the flame to come on. I think Jan's in it for the same reason I'm in it. I think Jan just can't say no to an adventure. I think it's simple as that. 
It's a chance of a lifetime, and it's really going to test your limits. For me, it'll test my mountaineering skills, and it will also test my photographic skills, seeing as I'm there as a photographer. And to say no is to deny myself to be all that I can be. I'm doing my design. I'm having a good time. Well, look, give us a big smile. Come on. Yes, yes. <laughs> Very good. Very good. When I was standing in the doorway, just before I pushed off, it felt exactly like being in the starting gate of a ski race. You have the same count, the same leg movements, you know, ready, set, go. And it was almost as if this wall hit you and pushed you backwards, as if it had arms. And my two instructors kept shaking me, and I thought they were trying to tell me to relax. So I would relax more and more, and they kept shaking and kept shaking, and I realized that they wished I was a little more tense. But I was having so much fun. A friend of mine defined adventure as the place you wish you were when you aren't and the place you wish you weren't when you are. <laughs>